Good morning, and welcome to Morning Movie News, where Boyd Holbrook is having quite the week. Now, Boyd Holbrook, no relation to Hal Holbrook, uh, got his big break on Netflix's Narcos, where he co-stars with Pedro Pascal uh, briefly uh, on Game of Thrones and also, unfortunately, ha the lesser half of the Great Wall casting controversy, you know, the whole white savior and apparently Latino savior problem, uh, but also Wagner Mora as pa Pablo Escobar. Now, Wagner Mora is my favorite on Narcos because he transformed himself inside and out. And by that, I mean he not only physically transformed the way he, he looks to play Pablo Escobar, uh, you know, gaining a lot of weight for the role, uh, but also he had to learn to speak Spanish because they, they changed it into a Spanish language show at the last minute. He's from Brazil, so his native language is Portuguese, and they at first said that Narcos was going to be in English. So he was like, no problem. And then they were like, we're going to do it in Spanish. And he was like, Okay, I'll just learn Spanish, I guess. So kudos to him. But Wagner Mora isn't getting any uh, big opportunities out of Narcos, but uh, Boyd Holbrook is. And I don't even actually think, think that Boyd Holbrook had to learn any Spanish to be on the show, come to think of it. But good for Boyd Holbrook. Well, he's not the person I would have picked to go to the next level off of Narcos, I'm excited for him to prove me wrong. Uh, now, it was, uh, it was revealed that he's playing Donald Pierce in the upcoming Logan movie, which is the Wolverine film, which is now what everyone will have to say every time they're like, are you excited for Logan? And people will be like, that doesn't sound like a very good movie. And then you have to go, it's the Wolverine movie. And they go, oh, yeah, I'm excited for that. And then you realize that that's not really a very good title for the movie. But uh, Donald Pierce, of course, from the Hellfire Club, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, although I think they're probably gonna be using him in a different capacity in uh, the Logan film. Again, it sounds so bad when you just say Logan, you know, not when you're specifically talking, like when you're in the context of talking about X-Men movies. But anyway, this is the big headline. Benicio Del Toro has dropped out of the Predator film, uh, Shane Black's new upcoming movie. And it looks like Boyd Holbrook is gonna take his place, which I think is a very odd choice. I mean, how do you go from Benicio uh, to Boyd Holbrook, right? Well, Benicio dropped out, by the way, in case you're wondering, because they just couldn't make the schedule uh, work out because he has so many other commitments. He's, uh, as many of you pointed out in Star Wars Episode Eight. Uh, you know, um, I, I believe that's finished filming though, but still, you know, he's part of the Star Wars universe. He's got to make that Sicario sequel. So he's just simply not available, even though they did delay Predator's uh, start date to try and accommodate him. But in the end, it just wasn't, wasn't doable. So Boyd Holbrook's going to take over. Although, come on, isn't Wagner Mora a better substitute for Benicio Del Toro? But uh, we'll see. Uh, Boyd Holbrook, again, I'm looking forward to him proving me wrong as to who should have gotten uh, the, the call to the, go to the big leagues off of uh, Netflix's Narcos. But I'm curious, are you a Boyd Holbrook fan? I mean, I don't just like Boyd Holbrook. I just don't see that special spark there in terms of, like, star power. Uh, but these are fantastic opportunities. And as some of the trades have pointed out, Boyd Holbrook has been developing a very nice relationship with Fox. Uh, you know, he was um, uh, in the film Morgan. Uh, he's in the upcoming, you know, Logan. Uh, the Wolverine movie is a Fox film, so they must like what they see in the dailies, and so they've decided to put him uh, in Predator. Also, Shane Black uh, has a good eye for talent, and so he wouldn't sign on for Boyd Holbrook. I think he has the, I think Shane Black is successful enough at this point that he could have some veto power. So, but maybe they just need to get going and, and that's who they've decided to go with. So, but I'm just curious to your thoughts on Boyd Holbrook and how do you think he's going to do both in the Logan film and in the Predator film taking over for Benicio Del Toro. Then speaking of Narcos, I want to take a little bit of a detour for the second story and just talk about something that I've noticed in terms of um, diversity in entertainment. Now, this is really just on television. I think television is an easier place to make these kinds of changes because it's just such an expansive space. There are so many pockets, right? And, uh, you know, you know, you, you can, um, I think, succeed with less viewers than, let's say, a movie needs, right? So Narcos, for those of you who, who watch that show, it's almost entirely Latino talent, except for Boyd Holbrook, right? And say what you will about him being the one getting opportunities off of the show. But anyway, and also the show is almost entirely in Spanish Spanish language. So it's a subtitled show, but it does very well. They've, they've just greenlight 
greenlit two more seasons of Narcos on Netflix. So that's very exciting. And then last night I was watching ABC sitcom lineup. Didn't like American Housewife. Uh, and then I was I wanted to watch The Real O'Neills. And then uh, I was like, okay, I'll watch Fresh Off the Boat in the middle because they're going to Taiwan. That'll be interesting. So because uh, I, I haven't liked Fresh Off the Boat in the past because the, the, I think the writing isn't as strong as some other sitcoms out there. But this was not only a very good episode, but halfway through watching it, after like the novelty of seeing Taiwan wore off, I was like, wait a minute. I'm watching an American sitcom on one of the major networks, ABC, that is 100% Asian actors. And you would not, it's just totally awesome. You would never notice the difference in terms of quality and just like the tone uh, of other sitcoms, right? You're not like, what am I watching? You know, it's, it very much feels like uh, American television, but it just happens to be 100% Asian actors. And a couple of lines were in Mandarin, uh, the local language of Taiwan. Uh, but I just thought that was really, really interesting. Uh, and I think that it's very encouraging. And then I would also like to say that when I watched The Real O'Neills afterwards, I mean, I've never seen, you know, George Takei really did a great job calling attention to the lack of uh, representation for Asian uh, Asians in Hollywood. And that's something that also that Alan Yang spoke to quite eloquently at the Emmys when he and um, Asis Ansari won uh, for The Master of None for their the episode Parents. Uh, great episode. Great show, by the way. Very, very good show. But, you know, talking about the fact that there's many Asian Americans in the United States as Italian Americans, yet Italian Americans have far more representation in uh, movies. But that took some time, too. I mean, I don't think there were a lot of Italian Americans being represented in the movies of the 1930s and 40s and 50s, etc. So anyway, on The Real O'Neills, they had uh, a secondary character introduced. Uh, the main character uh, started an LGBT club. LGBT club at school and uh, he actually ended up to his surprise having uh, a, a lesbian student join and they cast an Asian actress. So if you've been watching the new fall season of television uh, this uh, this season, I'm sure that you've also noticed a huge influx of Asian talent on on-camera roles uh, from shows like Gotham uh, to uh, Speechless to The Real O'Neills etc. So really interesting and actually all the time I see a lot of you commenting about what about actors of color, where are their opportunities and I can honestly say I think this is the best time it's ever been to be an actor of color in Hollywood. There are a lot of opportunities and still a lot of opportunities for white actors of course as well so I don't think anything's being taken away from anyone else. I mean I think this is how it works. You get the secondary roles and if someone really makes an impression then they start to get a fan base and they start to become valuable a commodity to Hollywood and then they move up to the next level of being a stronger supporting role then you get to the lead. That's just how it works uh, in any business actually but also in, in Hollywood as well. So this is a very important first step that happening. Uh, now it's also a great time to be a person of color behind the camera because Fetty Alvarez is following James Wan's uh, footsteps out of the horror genre into comic book uh, or blockbuster, potential blockbuster movies. Now, of course, it's on a much smaller scale. James Wan movies gross much more than Don't Breathe, uh, overall have grossed much more than Fetty Alvarez's. He's done the Evil Dead remake and now uh, Don't Breathe. And also James Wan went on to do Furious 7, and he really did a fantastic job with that film. And of course, now he's doing Aquaman. Uh, but Fetty Alvarez, uh, Don't Breathe, was very impressive at the box office. And now he has an opportunity. He's going to move out of horror. In the past, you know, horror is a great entry point into the industry because it's a low-budget movie where they need, low, uh, like, new talent. They need to keep their costs down. But it's one of the best places to make a splash at the box office, even though it's a small movie. So, you know, uh, you don't have to be so reliant on reviews, etc. Although I don't believe that Fetty Alvarez is like it, or James Wan. They get good reviews as well. But it's um, horror, I think, it's been even though horror is a great place to make a career it can be very hard to get out of it just ask the late Wes Craven who talked about how important horror was as an inroad to the industry but also was never able to get out of the genre uh, but James Wan successfully has boy has he and now Fetty Alvarez has the same kind of opportunity he's going to direct the uh, film adaptation of Incognito which was a miniseries comic by Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips, uh, which now is printed over, it was originally at Marvel, uh, you know, when they had their creators program. Uh, well, it was not like for new creators, it was for established creators to like, kind of like, you know, do whatever they wanted. And now the comic uh, has a home in image. But anyway, the story is a supervillain 
turns on his boss, joins witness protection. Uh, find, they take his powers away from him, but he finds a way to get them back. Uh, at like I think like um, at not quite the same level, but he still has superpowers. And he decides to become a vigilante, and he's deciding who he is. Is he a villain? Is he a hero? Is he a little bit of both? But his uh, vigilante activities alert his old boss that he turned on and had to go into witness protection in the first place to find his whereabouts. So to me, that sounds a little bit like a darker version of The Incredibles, right? Uh, a super family living and, uh, you know, hiding amongst us, having to decide what they want to do and struggling without being able to, you know, be true to their, their who they are. But this guy has to figure out who he is. It sounds like a pretty good story. I've actually never read it, despite being a comic book reader, because I think that Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips, while I like both of them quite a bit, I think when they work together, they, they're, they're very prolific. They make a lot of these, like, film noir kind of comics, right? I think they're, I don't, they don't personally appeal to me. They're a little too slow. I think that Sean Phillips, I, I prefer Ed Brubaker as a writer than I do Sean Phillips as an artist. I feel his artwork isn't particularly exciting, even though it's very well respected. And uh, as we've often discussed in the past, uh, particularly on Think About the Ink, art is what can make or break a comic, not the writing. Sad but true, because it's a visual medium. But anyway, so while I, I'm not a big particular fan of their collaborations, I, I think they definitely have a lot of uh, credibility in the industry, and it's a, it's a good property to pick up. Uh, and Alvarez, I think, is a good choice to direct it because I think he'll be able to plus it and make it a little bit more commercial because I think he's a pretty savvy director in that regard. I mean, I think one of the reasons that Don't Breathe succeeded was because it had like a really, really crazy, oh crap moment in it uh, that I won't ruin for anyone who hasn't seen the movie. I haven't actually seen the movie because he goes a little too far for me, uh, but I read about it for sure because a lot of people discussed it because it was, I think, a little controversial. But anyway, Chernin Entertainment is going to be producing this and Chernin Entertainment Whenever you see that C, you know, whenever you go to the movies and, you know, there's like a C hanging like from, from a, uh, the ceiling with like a stone corner and it, they reflect Chernin Entertainment, right, uh, on the wall. Uh, that's this company. And they do a lot of movies. They're like behind the Planet of the Apes movies, I believe, etc. And so because that guy Peter Chernin's producing, I think it's very likely that this movie will actually see the light of day. And I mention that because so often comic books will get optioned and someone will make a deal to direct, but then we never hear from it again. But I think that you will hear from this. And uh, that, that with Fetty Alvarez at the helm, it's probably going to take shape pretty quickly. So maybe we'll be seeing some casting announcements pretty soon. Now, speaking of casting, that's a perfect way to go into our viewer question of the day from Heidi Fairgreave. And Heidi had a great question about James Bond. Uh, we were just talking yesterday about Daniel Craig saying, okay, now I want to come back, especially because now they want to give me $150 million to do two more movies. So he's like, no, I'll come back. And Heidi had an interesting question. She said, hi, Grace, this is my question. Why not cast an unknown? Because it would be a nice change uh, or maybe even an up-and-coming actor, right? Like, Because I talked about the fact that one of the reasons that uh, the Broccoli's, uh, the Broccoli's being the family that owns the Bond franchise, and they, they are the ones who uh, shepherd it uh, and make all the creative decisions, uh, they have no other really good strong choices for James Bond, which is one of the reasons they're so desperate to keep Daniel Craig. So Heidi's saying, why not get an unknown or an up-and-coming actor to take on the role? And I think that's a great question, Heidi. So the first part of it is, is that James Bond is an older character. So it's harder to find, um, you know, someone, it's harder to sell an older unknown, right? I mean, sometimes you could do it. You could get like someone like, I don't know, J.K. Simmons, right? Or Brian Cranston. Those were older actors who hadn't, you know, they were working actors, but they never jumped to the level of stardom, right? Being a draw. But, you know, TV was able to take those actors uh, and make them, you know, pretty big, uh, you know, um, pretty big draws. Or I would also even point to Bob Oden, um, uh, Odenkirk, uh, on um, Better Call Saul and stuff like that. I think he's a really another really great example. So it can be done, but I, don't, I think it's a big risk for James Bond, and you know, especially because they need a certain type of older, like suave character. And you know, I think that it's the character actors who tend to stick around Hollywood the, for the long term, even if they don't become big name uh, actors. And I think that all those people, J.K. Simmons, Brian Cranston, Bob Odenkirk, they're all character actors. And uh, so having like a leading man type actor, it's harder to find ones that are really good actors that stuck with it, even though they didn't find success. Because, you know, something they never really talk about with SAG is that while like a very small percentage do very well in Hollywood and are able to support themselves, the vast majority of actors, you know, you can't support yourself being an actor. You have to get another job. And it's just a really, it's a tough gig. And also there's, it just involves so much rejection. And it's hard to take that for decades uh, if you know you don't have any any uh, encouragement really, and that so that it's a tough business. 
But Heidi, also, if they, the one way they could do it is if they cast a major star as the villain or they had a star director like Christopher Nolan. We talked about Christopher Nolan potentially coming in maybe uh, and being a way to help uh, keep the, the Bond franchise going. And I think as long, again, it's all about, we talked a couple of days ago about you know, the importance of someone vouching for the material. And so I think if you can get a director to vouch for the material, therefore they're also kind of vouching for your star. It's another way they could have gotten an Asian unknown as the lead in Ghost in the Shell if they'd had a star director. But they didn't go that route. And the, uh, Mulan is able to cast an unknown Asian actress uh, for the Disney film because Disney's the star there, right? And the property is the star. It's incredibly well known. So I think that you know you need you need a hook, and I think that Bond. You would think that well, isn't Bond the hook? I think there have been enough Bond films that haven't connected, and I think there's so much competition these days, and that Bond sometimes seems like an antiquated idea. That's one of the reasons people are trying to modernize it. And they did to some degree with Judy Dench as the first M, but then they've gone back, of course. But they did also do they've made uh, cast a black actress as Money Penny. They're making changes there. Uh, they tried to I think to some degree hinted a, a, a gay or at least a, a bisexual villain with uh, Javier Bardem's character. Character. So they're trying to, to modernize, I think, Bond, but they're doing it uh, very subtly and slowly. Uh, but if they wanted to perhaps have like a, um, if they wanted to ever get away with a non-white actor in the role or a non-star, you'd have to have some kind of, uh, I think, backup in a star director or a star villain to ease that transition. So Heidi, it's a totally fair question. It would be, it would be very tricky to do, but I think it's doable with the, with the, with that with those strategies uh, in mind. And I think that uh, it would be a better if they didn't go with Daniel Craig. I would think they should go with an up-and-coming actor because I don't really see any other options. I would rather they go with a uh, an unknown or an up-and-coming actor rather than some of the other people that they've talked about. Theo James from the Divergent films, Tom Hiddleston, uh, even Hugh Jackman. I think those are all horrible choices, and I'd rather roll the dice with someone that's an unknown entity than someone I know isn't going to do well in the role. Heck, maybe Boyd Holbrook will get the call, but he's not from the UK. All right, so anyway, uh, that's today's uh, morning movie news. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please write down below think today's top three stories, Heidi's question about Bond, anything you'd like to see covered tomorrow, and any questions that you might have. Thanks for watching. Bye.